On the western shore of Great Britain lies Wales. Wales is not a nation in the accepted sense, for she pays allegiance to the British crown. As part of the highly industrialized British Empire, she takes pride in her wealth of natural resources, her foundries, mills, and factories. But behind this modern facade lies another treasure in which the Welsh people take even greater pride, their rich historical background, their wealth of ancient lore. Our story is of this heritage and of those who still cling to the old, independent Welsh ways. Out of the past has grown the foundation of Welsh traditions. Some of these are born of legend and myth. King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table roamed these lands on conquests of honor. And in these ageless hills, the mystic Merlin conjured up his magic spells. But there is historical tradition here as well. Harlech Castle is a landmark of Welsh heroism. In tribute to the battles fought here, the stirring Welsh anthem, Men of Harlech, was composed. Through the centuries, the invader has often come to this misty land to challenge Welsh independence. Great granite fortresses still remain, reminders in ruin of the Welshman's fierce and passionate struggle to remain Welsh. From these bastions, English kings laid siege to Wales in the Middle Ages. Out of the struggle and strife which these ramparts symbolize grew a pure and distinctive national culture Today, these castles stand as citadels, keeping silent watch over all that is truly Welsh. Nothing is more Welsh than their ancient language. Their theater is dedicated to its preservation. Even the director's instructions are given in the native tongue. This old classic tells of a wife's scheme to murder her husband. When her plans go awry, She's berated for her folly. How said it on Whipio de Vradi, then I backed to Davod Ben Tailisal? Nay, solidly was the Argelin Gerthau. But it's not in the language alone that Welsh tradition is preserved. For in music, their cultural identity reaches its highest expression. Nearly every village has its local choral group. A hayloft suffices as a practice stage. And even for rehearsals, they don traditional costumes. is the Welshman's appreciation for music that even rehearsals draw interested spectators. emphasis is placed on the arts, in the shadows of ancient ramparts, the business of everyday living goes on. 
Nearly three-fourths of Wales' boundary is coastline, much of it isolated from industrialized seaports. So here, many people rest a living from the sea. When the tide nears its ebb, a group of mussel fishermen discuss weather conditions and decide on the day's destination. Special long-handled rakes with eight or ten inch tines are used to gather the mussels. Once the sturdy dories are launched, they are taken in tow. When they reach the shoals, each boat operates independently. Mussels cling to the bottom by tough, hair-like fibers, so strenuous effort is required to tear them loose. Ton upon ton of these shellfish are harvested yearly to contribute to the country's food supply. Another unusual occupation is the gathering of cockles. This delicate morsel, famed in song, abounds on the tidal sand flats of Wales. This woman, now past 80, has been gathering cockles since she was eight. Bitter winds from the Irish Sea demand a coat for the horse. The garment keeps the horse warm, and the horse keeps the garment warm for the owner on the return journey. Strict regulations set a minimum size, and so the cockles are scooped into sieves designed to retain only the keepers. Cockles are prepared for the table by boiling. They're similar to steamed clams and are sealed in jars and marketed. From seacoast to mountains, Wales ranks high in natural resources. While her coal mines are world famous and highly modernized, slate quarrying better typifies the Welshman's rugged individualism. caverns, this shale-like formation is quarried by the light of flares. Underground, one team breaks huge chunks into blocks of a size convenient to haul out. Above ground, another team finishes dressing the slate. First, the splitting, done with chisel and mallet. Some Welsh slate is so fine of grain that it can be split as thin as an eighth of an inch. There are many uses for slate, but the most important is for roofing. For this, it must be trimmed and squared by a machine appropriately called a guillotine. While this mountainous region offers rich mineral resources, 
The rugged terrain discourages animal husbandry. However, the resourceful Welsh have developed a breed of sheep that thrives in the rocky hills. Occasionally, in foraging for food, an animal becomes stranded. The men have learned from experience to expect such behavior from sheep who forget they're not really mountain goats. Even with a strong rope and a stout anchor man, the descent can be dangerous. It's hardly an enthusiastic welcome, but at least the shepherd's efforts meet with no resistance. Although rescue is a certainty now, it's hard to tell whether the wagging tail is an appreciation or protest. fisherman, miner, or shepherd, home and hearth remain the seat of old traditions. Often the shepherd's house becomes a concert hall when neighbors drop in for an evening's entertainment called a nosenlauen. Nosenlauen means literally happy evening and it's a high point in the rural social season. The occasion is enhanced by the presence of a neighbor's pretty daughter, come to entertain with an old ballad. its roots in antiquity, so too do many of the Welsh cling to old ways in matters of industry. And wool production has an outlet in local textile manufacturing. This woolen mill is over 100 years old and has remained in the same family for generations. The operator of the spinning mule, now past 70, has been on this same job since he was 16. After years of service, this ancient machine is still in perfect working order. And interruptions are usually caused by nothing more serious than a severed strand on the bobbin. From the spinning mule, completed skeins are taken to the weaving shed, where the wool is woven on an ancient loom. urban textile industry is highly modernized, a determined effort is made to preserve these home skills and crafts. Even the marketing is homespun, and the front of the factory becomes the display room. By the direct method of producer to customer, the old timers are able to meet competition and stay in business. today 
is a reflection of the past. This economy may lack modern efficiency, but it does have one advantage. It does not discard experience due to age. The skill of the elder citizen is fully appreciated. This wood turner has a ready market for his goods, for wooden utensils are preferred over modern crockery by many Welsh housewives. Although he lives alone, his life is by no means lost in loneliness. He has a niece who comes to tidy his home and prepare simple delicacies for his pleasure. She knows his weakness for special Welsh cakes called cock and gris, a type of scone similar to baking powder biscuits. With a griddle sizzling, the cakes are nearly ready. And after a session at the lathe, uncle is ready for the cakes. They're toasting to the proper turn, a hot cup of tea. A Welsh girl's reputation as a housewife depends upon her skill with a scone. The supplies she's baked will tide him over till her next visit. artisan have not been allowed to die out. This man has special use for a bundle of hazelwood twigs, which he soaked to make them pliable. In his shop, with the help of a primitive vise, he shaves them into long, flat slats. Right now, what they're to be used for is anybody's guess. But one thing is certain. Give a Welshman a witch hazel wand, and he's apt to weave a bit of magic. When the ribs are bent upward and the edge finished by a wattle weave, it begins to look more like a basket, or perhaps a baby's bassinet. This covering suggests that it will soon be completed. With a coat of pitch for waterproofing, it could be a bathtub. At any rate, it seems to pass inspection when it's time to take delivery. Oh, well, if a paddle goes with it, it must be a boat. Actually, these one-man craft are called coracles. They're of prehistoric origin, and Julius Caesar found them when he invaded Wales in the first century BC. Historians claim the Celts migrated to Wales in these flimsy craft across the Irish Sea. Few remain today, and those are used exclusively in drift net fishing for salmon. Between the coracles, the net forms a barrier almost certain to halt a hapless fish. When they feel a strike, 
the men bring the coracles together, forming the net into a sort of bag with the salmon held fast inside. Much that is artistic in present-day Wales has been fashioned from a practical past. For instance, at one time, wooden clogs were the main footwear of the farmers and the fisher folk, for they were waterproof and durable. Today, they're favored for dancing, for the noise they make. But the method of manufacture remains primitive and unchanged. These unique shoes play an important part in helping preserve Welsh culture. Children wear them for clog dancing parties. Everyone's equipped with dancing shoes, except for the shoemaker's daughter. But hers are nearly finished. Now she too can join the fun. In their traditional costumes, the youngsters conjure up a picture out of the past to uphold Welsh tradition in the present as they hurry toward the village square. type of dancing originated in the country barns. Along with the fun, it was customary to clean up the barn, so brooms play a prominent part. in their theater, music and song, in their skills, crafts and dancing, the people of Wales honor the legacy of their traditions. For theirs is a culture as old as the historic hills, through which echo the sounds of a way of life, a way born in antiquity and preserved with a determination that neither time nor the invader has been able to quell.